So everyone back again. So we will not let the talks before weren't fun, but now this is the dedicated entertainment part because it's on classic gaming. Especially it's about the very first digital video game. And since there are some controversies on what is a video game, we will uh, say video games as in interactive visual games on a digital computer because there were uh, analog things before and some would like to define a video game as running on analog hardware only and especially manipulating analog video only. So Space War was the first video game and it was uh, as we can see here conceived in 1961 by a group we, that named itself the Hinkham Study Group on Space Warfare, consisting of Steve Russell, uh, Peter Sampson, Dan Edwards, Martin Kratz, uh, Alan Kotuk, Stephen Piner, and Robert R. Saunders. And some of them are really famous. So Peter Sampson is the father of all the hackers who wrote in 1959 the TCMR uh, <coughs> dictionary, the tech model, Wilgot Club Dictionary at the MIT, and this became the Shargon file. And if you have read the Shargon file, you are a hacker. So uh, Steve Russell, some may know him for the man who made Lisp a real computer language. So when Lisp was designed, uh, in 1956 by McCarthy, it was just an abstract language and not really meant to run on a computer and it was Steve Russell who thought, oh, why not make it an actual language? And so we have Lisp. And this might be interesting if we really have a look at the code. So uh, there are some first, uh, some really interesting things. And it was first publicly presented at the MIT Science Open House Day in 1962 in May. And it was even in the month before, in April, published for the first time and announced in the first issue of Decoscope, uh, the news publication of tech for its users. So um, let's have a look at this, what it looks like. So. This is a uh, space war in emulation and it's a game for two players. So you're not playing against the machine, but in the machine. And uh, you get two spaceships and the spaceships can fly actually. And there is gravity embodied by this pulsing star in the middle. And of course you can shoot one at another and if you make it maybe this is quite in no we are not in range so there are nice pixel dust explosions and there is also as we can see here hyperspace the first video game has already had hyperspace um, so Let's have this running. Um, let's have a few words on the machine this was done. Uh, this was implemented on the TAC PDP-1. Uh, this is a computer that was introduced in 1959, or I bet it was announced in 1959 in August, and came on the market in 1960, I think the first prototype and this was an important machine because it went to PBN and at PBN this was a machine uh, Chasier Licklider fell in love with and this is the guy who became the uh, upper administrator officer who gave us the internet, the ARPANET. So without this machine no internet. Uh, there's the full name, DAC is Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, this is a 
also a really important uh, corporation in terms of computers. So in the 1980s, if you needed a really good computer with a reliable OS, this was without question a Vox. That's computers. Everyone would tell you this is the stuff. Uh, and PDP is for Grand Data Processor, and we may know that there is no word of a computer in there. Why is that so? So behind this, see, first computer was a sold as a screen. It was also the first computer that could be switched on just by a flip of a single switch, and it would be imme immediately on. Uh, before this were often procedures over 20 minutes with some error cases and so it was plugged in a single wall plug, wall socket, uh, with normal uh, uh, current, household current, no raised floor, single main unit, this is all you get and it has also a light pan. And this uh, has a great uh, tradition with MIT computing. As we know from prototype machines, the TXO, the TX2, which is very important for the development of graphic programming. And this was the common, uh, the, let's say, a commercial version. So the founders of DAC were uh, working on these experimental MIT machines. And they uh, founded DAC in, I think, 1956. And back to why isn't there a computer in the name? Uh, there was an evaluation of computer use in the government, U.S. government at the time, and it was devastating. Productivity, uh, no avail, and uh, all uh, purchase planes for uh, computer equipment were put on a halt. So to get funding uh, for the corporation, uh, Tech decided they would only do uh, digital modules, and this is what they did the first three years. And then they decided to build this computer based on their models, modules, and still selling a computer to government or so uh, wouldn't work, but a program data process is not, not a computer and you can buy this. So that's why this is a PDP-1. So the machine was an 18-bit machine. It used one's complement, which means there is plus zero, or normal zero, and a minus zero. And by the way, there's also minus zero in JavaScript, especially if you decide to use the language version, version 1.2. There's really minus two. Uh, if you uh, divide, uh, minus zero, if you divide uh, Minus two by two, you get minus zero, and this is not equal zero. Uh, so back to the PDB-1, it's an 18-bit machine. It has one com one's complement. Can you read this? Maybe a bit bigger. Uh, bigger. Uh, it has a whooping 4K of core memory, but this is 18-bit uh, memory, so it's about 9K 8-bit but actually it's a bit more. So uh, since instructions and uh, data were packed into one word, and there's a bigger word, and you need uh, less instructions to do the same thing, it's like more like 12 or 16K on an 8-bit octet thing. Uh, cycle time was five microseconds, because if you have a look at this, and you know that this long, is a nanosecond traveling electron, uh, in terms of an electron traveling through wire. This is clearly not in the nanosecond range. So we are uh, five microseconds cycle time. One instruction will take one cycle. Memory look up another one. So there are uh, 100,000 iterations per second. And it worked with punch tape. We see it here, stored here, lying around, paper tape. Uh, yeah, and this was the first toy computer as coined by GM Kratz. And another find that's important for this is this display, first commercial display. Uh, 
the type 30 display. Uh, resolution was a Hoopink 1K by 1K display locations. Uh, you got eight intensities, uh, but this wasn't bitmapped. We'll see in a second why. Um, this was a so-called point plotting display or short XY display. So this is random access. You give it a display location. The beam just travels there, intensifies, next location intensifies. And this is all fine and forget. There is no memory, no repeating. This is not vector or so. This is just single dots. And the tube was originally designed for mechanical scan readers. So this is, this you have this traveling beam ground and there's an object and it lights up and it glows, it stays glowing. So it features this dual P7 phosphor. This has a short bright sustain in this uh, machine. It's light blue and a long persistence. So it's five, eight, 20 seconds after glow depending on the lightning si situation. And interesting thing in this is the price list. So this was actually a cheap machine. This was in the range of a battery drum computer with no memory at all. And you got a full transistorized real-time computer, the first commercial real-time computer at this price. But Look at average prices in 1960. What this means in mobile money, a car was 2,400 US dollars. And this machine was 120K. And the display was 14K and an average home was 12K. So you could buy a house for this display. Uh, but this is really serious hardware. It's working at high voltages to do this old high speed traveling. It must. Uh, uh, cool and ringing resulting from this high travel speed and so and this is actually uh, the uh, uh, let's say uh, causing the most delay in programming the PTP one so one instruction is five microseconds and you have to wait 50 microseconds so it's 10 at the time 10 instructions would use uh, to display in the next dot uh, cause of all these cooling times. And this is the official price list for the PDP-1, I think, from 1963. And you see whooping prices. And if you have a look at 4K of additional memory, this is 30,000 US dollars. And this is three homes, because we need I mean, a controller at 10K. And if you do the math, math, uh, 1K by 1K uh, screen resolutions, eight intensities plus none. If we would want to do a frame buffer for this, we could fly to the moon. So uh, even if memory access times and so, and the enormous bus you wouldn't really need to build this kind of technology. If you had this, the costs were so enormous, you can do that and you really had no choice, but this shoot and forget uh, point plotting display uh, technology. And this is what nearly all the 1960 displays used. So for space war, this is not the first online emulator. So actually, it's based on this one, done by the Silverman brothers, famous in the uh, old computer community and com uh, computer history community, and Vladimir Gerasimov, who did the original port of Tetris to the PC, so part of history himself. And you get this. And this is clearly not what this game really was because this is lacking many features. You uh, have not the impression that this display would give you. And I think this is really uh, a work of art with this concentric display in this hexagonal uh, space age design housing and all this afterglow, this trays that are drawn, and this is missing. And uh, 
actually I named the eight intensities that the display used, and these didn't scale very good. So what the game did is it would draw the background uh, only every second cycle. So uh, what most emulators do like this is they just patch two frames one on another, and this is not what you want, and it has also scaled chips, and it's not really the, the true stuff. So this is what we got this here. Uh, important note, if we scroll down on the first screen, this is also uh, the machine, uh, the game, the first game pads, joysticks, uh, then called control boxes were invented. And this is a re reconstruction of these boxes uh, done by Tom Tilley, former NHL star, who does some university lectures today. And he did a lecture on them. And actually he used this emulator to, to prove the concept. Uh, so Carl's uh, obligation is to have uh, gamepad uh, support for this game, and you get this in Chrome, and you get it in Firefox. But it, there is no guarantee what kind of gamepads really would work. So uh, simple stuff like Atari controller, so sure, but more advanced, it depends on the make. Uh, there's also a virtual controller that you get. Uh, if you're using this by an iPad, uh, so let's hide them again. Whoop! Name. So, and the real complicated stuff here is actually doing the display. This is not that, that simple, like just managing a simple bitmap. Uh, we have to do something more. But let's talk about core emulation. This is the control console of the PTP1, also Space Age designed. And you see that the switches for to control some bits are always in groups of three. So before uh, the IBM Systems 360, bits didn't come in octet, but in triples. This is why there was octal notation. So uh, if you have all these three bits set, set it's a seven, and the next bit set would be a 10, and so on. Uh, this is quite fun in JavaScript, because vanilla JavaScript has octal digits. So this is the full address range for 4K, 7777, with a leading zero. Uh, your sign bit would be uh, 04, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So, strict mode, strict octal notation, you would really have to do something like that to use this. You would have to find a variable for every. Uh, digit, you know, and you really want to use octal digits because this is how all this is constructed. ESX reintroduces that with um, like the uh, hex notation, but this time with an O. But because there is O, X in uppercase, there is also O, O in uppercase. So, um, much fun with that. <laughs> so, how do we do the emulation? <coughs> obviously, obviously, we need some memory. Important is why do we do, uh, do we want to do emulation and not start static conversion, like Norbert Kerr described before the summer break. Um, this is mainly because computers at this time didn't have a stack. So necessarily, every program was 
self-modificating. So to do a simple return from a subroutine, you had to store uh, the return address. You had to fix up uh, a jump back to where you came. Uh, and also, we see in this kind of code often things like indirect addressing used to take the address path. You remember instructions, instruction was a both opcode, a bit for indirect addressing, and there is the address or the operand. And we often see that there is, and there were uh, instructions to just deposit something in the address part or here, so to address uh, ranges of this, these words. And so there would be, uh, let's say, an address you uh, used to add something, and this was point to some kind of object. And then there is uh, another instruction that would, would use just this address part for a pointer. Yeah? Okay. And uh, so we really have to do this in emulation. Moreover, this program features uh, cheat code. There's a cheat compiler to do the outlines. Uh, so what we do, we uh, just define the instruction codes and we would have some kind of loop and we would go, uh, and it's a really simple instruction, add a bit more complex but just simple bit manipulations. We would have to set some flags or fix something up because there's minus zero. And the machine did this and there are quite, quite uh, more complicated things like multiplication code and networks for this and we have to, to do that all. Interesting part is display. Uh, as we said, um, 1K by 1K, and just managing this and two blurs and uh, emulating all this analog stuff in a cycle uh, for every frame is just too much. So what could we do? Uh, we could do queues for pixels because there are only very few pixels actually set. And uh, so we will use a queue where there are objects to store pixel informations and just manipulate them. And further, what we really don't want to have is garbage collection kicking in. So we don't use uh, normal array operations like pop or things like that or push, but uh, manage our own top of stack and reuse objects. This is quite usual stuff. Uh, and as there is just few time left, pairs, pairs of high level optimization JavaScript. Interesting thing about uh, this display code, there is a bit of code that is uh, emulating electrostatic effects, like uh, a dot wouldn't decay as fast if there are other activations around, and if it's single on the screen, it would decay a bit faster. And so there's time-intensive code. And that is run on a more decent uh, client, like an iPad or something like that. There's also code who does it a bit slower. And there is an opt-out, so if you see that we are laggy, uh, just call this use electrostatic thing, with a Boolean or false, and opt out of this. What actually happens on an iPad is nothing. This hasn't got any effect. What, I, I can't really confirm this, but uh, the only sc scenario that I can think of is you're on a mobile client, this has very low memory and is actually in need of memory in the need of runtime because it's already lagging. But it's in a higher optimization level because you won't opt out at the first hiccup but on the 10th or so. And at this time, it already kicked out this part 
because this variable here looks quite pretty static to the, comp uh, to the runtime engine. And it needs memory, so uh, it kicks out what it doesn't need. Uh, it's in need of runtime, so it won't go cheat again. So this part of code is actually lost. Uh, what can we do? We can just take these loops and put them in extra functions and go out of this for these functions, and this actually works. So we learned something about JavaScript on this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if anyone is interested, this is how the actually assembly code works. And looks like. And yeah. So I really made a walk through this and every line is actually explained. And there's a proof of concept. There's also a JavaScript implementation that is uh, true to the letter to the original uh, assembly code uh, as a proof of concept for this. And you can see the source. So uh, it will be in the published paper. And uh, for anyone who is adventurous and would like to see what this is. Because this is really interesting stuff. There is object-oriented code in the uh, 1960s assembler. There is cheat code in it. There is uh, so many techniques for, for real time. Uh, you really want to have a look at this. Okay. <laughs>